Hello, and welcome to Fast Forward Episode 4. My name is Daniel Bounds, and I'm the head of marketing here at Vast Data. And today we're going to navigate through the topic of resilience. And to help me with this topic, I've invited our technologist extraordinaire and plenipotentiary, Howard Marks. Howard, welcome to the Vast Forward. Thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Howard, to paint the right picture for our audience and anyone who's interested when we talk about resilience, uh, there's an optic for storage administrators that sort of plays into their whole life around this. Describe a little bit relative to these two major concepts of data loss and data availability. Well, just as Maslow described humanity as hierarchy of needs, you know, first you need shelter and then you need food, storage administrators have a hierarchy of duty. First, they can't lose data. If you lose data, you might put the company out of business. Second, you can't let you separate your users from your data. You can't be unavailable because then your users can't run their applications. And then there's a big gap to the next pair where you have to make sure that you provide enough space and provide enough performance to keep your users happy. Because there's a difference between users with pitchforks and torches in the streets calling for your head, and users in the back room grumbling about how IT never pays any attention to them. So Howard, if we go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, here at the base of the pyramid is hardware. You always have to have hardware as a major component of a system, but talk a little bit about what VAST did from a hardware perspective, at least from the architecture point of view, to help build a more resilient platform. Sure, well, you know, the core of DACE is that everything is shared over the NVMe fabric. And so the NVMe fabric allows an arbitrary number of front end protocol servers to directly connect to an arbitrary number of SCM and QLC SSDs. And that connection is direct regardless of how large the cluster gets. And that means that we break the bottleneck that's traditionally existed in storage where one drive, SSD or spinning, can only be connected to a maximum of two controllers. With DACE, we've eliminated the concept of ownership. Every SSD is equally shared across every protocol server. And that lets us scale much broader and lets us have much higher levels of resilience because in a large cluster, when an SSD fails, we can have 15 or 20 or 30 of those protocol servers rebuilding in parallel. So Howard, let's quickly start to unpack the software side of resilience because I think that's where the majority of the benefit really comes from. Talk a little bit, if you will, about how locally decodable erasure codes increase the overall resiliency of the system. Well, locally decodable codes allow us to have the high level of resilience that we have without crushing overhead. You know, with traditional erasure codes, a Reed Solomon style erasure codes, you can generate an arbitrary number of parity strips. And so they, you could build a 16 plus four Reed Solomon system. The problem is when you do a recovery Read Solomon codes re require you to read all of the survivors. And so there's a maximum width to which you can write those stripes because they, before they become unwieldy. DACE gives us the ability to parallelize this rebuild across multiple protocol servers. And the locally decodable codes allow us to rebuild from a lost SSD using only a quarter of the survivors. So instead of having a practical limit of 16 data strips per stripe, we can write 150 data strips per stripe because both making the rebuild faster and minimizing the number of strips we need to rebuild, we can perform a rebuild from that very wide stripe and therefore only use a little less than 3% for data protection. So it sounds like the overhead is drastically different, but the time to rebuild is equally as significant. If you will, compare days versus traditional architectures in this light. Well, the, the thing that, that people forget about data loss is that the time to rebuild is a critical factor in that calculation. Because if you have 
a double parity system where you can lose two drives before data is at risk. The data is at risk until one of those two drives is rebuilt and the data is protected again. On many shared nothing systems, the back end network gets so clogged that these rebuilds take tens of days. Uh, because we can dedicate protocol servers to the rebuild and we can perform that function in parallel, a typical VAST system rebuilds in under 30 hours and that's throttled to minimize the impact on user performance. All right, Howard, that's a great point. And for those who are following along, if you will, summarize the key points that you just mentioned. Well, the, the first most important point is that we have four parity strips, and so we're protected against four device failures. And then because of the locally decodable codes, we can rebuild from a lost SSD only using a quarter of the survivors, which minimizes the impact on the system. And we can do that quickly because we parallelize the rebuild process across all of the protocol servers in the cluster, all of which means that where a shared nothing system has to deal with the fact that the, own, the data that need, it's needed for a rebuild is owned by particular nodes and bottlenecks at those nodes. We can parallelize the system and process rebuilds an order of magnitude faster. So all of this essentially leads us to the first point, which is keeping systems up. Uptime is critical, and for most is priority number one. Howard, talk a little bit more about the holistic view that universal storage has regarding uptime. It's easy to talk about the individual components, but it really comes down to users want to keep their systems running, uh, especially in the kinds of markets that we deal in. Uh, things are very time critical, or they run 724 and they can't afford downtime. And this means even little things like running a non-disruptive upgrade. And a non-disruptive upgrade, not for the easiest case of stateless NFS3, but for the hard case of uh, SMB users running video editing software in real time. It means being able to spread data across a large cluster so that a whole rack can go offline and the system continues to run and continues to stay online. It means just continuously thinking about what can go wrong and making sure that we have it covered. And I guess that's the real key that helps us protect against horrible things that can happen to your data. But there's also the added benefit as the system is maintenance. We don't take you offline. It's a seamless upgrade path with universal storage because of the architecture. Right, and that extends to when you decide that you need to upgrade your system because we've come out with new, denser, and or faster appliances that you want to replace your old ones with because you've run out of disk space. You can do that and have the system continue to run with multiple generations of hardware. We never require any kind of visible migration to the users. And that's you know, not just, we don't require you to shut all your users out for three weeks while you migrate data. That's you don't have to have jobs running and you don't have to have, monitor them. We'll just eventually send you an email that says, uh, those four enclosures that you decided to decommission, we've copied all the data off of them. You can power them down now. So in reality, no downtime. Oh, no downtime. The aggregate uptime of vast customers is over six nines. So that's an amazing data point, and that's across multiple different types of customer environments. Everybody who allows us to collect telemetry. So let's step to the side for a second. We mentioned it earlier, and actually at the beginning of the conversation, we talked a bit about legacy architectures, the shared nothing, stateful architectures of the past. Talk a little bit, if you will, about the impact on resiliency moving from that type of architecture to share everything where you do have more and more of the logic in a containerized environment. Well, the core of DACE is software, and that software runs in containers. And running the software in containers gives us several advantages at this stage and several theoretical advantages in the future. At this stage, 
it makes it much simpler to upgrade and maintain because the object that we replace in an upgrade is a container that we can spin up before we shut the old one down. And that makes the entire upgrade process much more efficient. Um, and simply using NFS, the containers simplify the, the distribution, the upgrade, the maintenance of the software in the system. And then that software makes all of the hardware, the SSDs and the HA enclosures, shared and available across the NVMe fabric. Um, in the future, we can, because they're standard containers, add further degrees of orchestration and add additional container types to provide more functions and allow us to dynamically allocate the compute resources in those front-end servers to a wider array of tasks. And I think that summarizes how different universal storage is from everything that's preceded it. It really is a different paradigm, and we talk so much about resilience, it also gives us the capability to talk about scale and performance and talk about efficiency without a doubt. Things like fail in place become critical. Some enterprise storage systems are designed around the enterprise storage support contract, and they don't even start rebuilding in the event of a node failure until the replaced, failed node has been replaced because they can get a little bit less storage overhead. And after all, you have a four-hour contract. You can afford four hours of risk. Well, we don't believe in that risk, and so we do rebuild in place. We're always rebuilding the system, leaving enough resources that we can continue to rebuild again after further failures. Howard, with that, we're going to end this episode, and I want to say thank you so much for your time. It's always illuminating to have discussions with you on all manner of storage topics. And if you want to learn more about the day's architecture and universal storage, visit vastdata.com for case studies and all types of technical resources we have available for you there. And stay tuned, because we're going to be back soon with Episode 5 of Vast Forward. Until then, stay safe, and thanks for tuning in.